everybody, how are you today? You are tuned in to Eric Jose on Making a Murderer on YouTube. I go over Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey's cases. I also go over other cases as time goes by. I go over the documents, the do the pictures, videos, anything really case related for that matter. Um, and I have many other videos that you can check out, just like the one you're about to see. Hello everybody, how are you doing today? Today, I have something <clears throat> pretty special really. and Well, at least in my opinion. I feel that this is pretty special. Um, you know, I mean, the way I, you know, I'm, I'm constantly looking into these, you know, these cases and stuff, you know, sometimes it does have a wearing effect, you know, looking at, particularly with gruesome subjects and things like that, you know, and you, uh, and you deal with, with certain things out there, certain unpleasant aspects of social media and things like that. And, and yeah, you, you know, sometimes it does wear you down. This story here, the story that I'm going to talk about today, is like, it's like recharged my battery. I was feeling a little bit weary. I, it's nice, you know, to to every once in a while when you ha when you go through all the muck, you know, to to really come across a story like this one. And this story that I'm going to be talking about today is about a gentleman named John Bunn. This is part of the Wrongful Conviction of Youth series that you may, I don't know, if you've noticed on my channel, I have a few of them now, uh, where I go, where I talk about cases in, in, in which a juvenile, a young juvenile or, in, or, or mentally limited juveniles are basically just chewed up and you know swallowed by the system uh there was you know i've done one about a, a guy named Devonte sanford um did another one about a kid named Corey williams um and today we're gonna be talking about john bunn now what's really unique about john bunn in my opinion folks is this guy was wrongfully convicted and he when he was wrong when he was wrongfully convicted he didn't know how to read or write and this is, I mean, to me, this is just amazing because out of a desire to want to talk to his mother and, and, and he knew he couldn't until he learned how to read and write. So spent, you know, his first couple of years in prison, learning how to read and write and getting his GED, bettering himself, even though he was wrongfully convicted, he was, he was looking to to build tools to help him cope and to help him eventually overcome really he was he he was self-educating himself he i mean he did, he went he did a lot of things to to help to help better himself and help put himself in a better position because obviously if he didn't educate himself, he would have been, it would have been, you know, it wouldn't have been, you know, very helpful to him if he was still talking like a, an illiterate 14 year old when he was trying to go through post conviction, you know, process, right? So the fact that he, he learned, he educated himself and he, and, and I mean, it's just amazing what this guy, this guy, I really do uh, admire him because. Even though he was wrongfully convicted, he was eventually exonerated. And what he wants to do, his desire, is he's not he's not focusing on complaining about what happened. He's not focusing on that. I wouldn't I would not hold it against him if he did. I certainly would not hold it against him if he did. But he has let go of that bitterness. And he is choosing to use his energy in a way that will put the tools for other young inmates like he was. That will put the tools, put the books in prison that will give these kids the ability to, to, to give themselves the tools to hopefully not reoffend when they get out. To hopefully find a different way through education, through knowledge right it's not always gonna work but you know what 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 he's doing what john bunn is doing is giving a few of them at least hopefully 
the ability to get themselves out of their whatever rut that they're stuck in. You know, it could be as simple as a, a drug habit that they that that they need to let go of that's that's constantly landing them in jail. I mean, it just depends on what it is. There's lots of different things, but for me, he is what he's trying to do is is help those who are you know the youth the young kids in prison to help them get the tools they need to if they do get motivated to break out of the mold to break out of the rut that they're in that he w- he he is doing everything he can to make sure that they have the resources in order to help themselves build the tools i think that's a huge huge help and instead of like i said instead of you know getting all pissy and bitter and mad about what happened he's turning it into a positive and that is just phenomenal it really truly is to me but let's not forget that this is part of the wrongful conviction of youth series and mr john bunn was 14 years old when he was arrested and convicted of murder and we're going to go through right now you're going to hear see the story and you know the highlights of of what happened to John Bunn from the age he was 14 and got arrested until until present day. So we're going to go ahead and go and go through that little story right now and then we'll, I'll come on back one more time at the end. My name is John Bunn. I was recently exonerated after 27 years for being accused and convicted of a crime I had no knowledge of, I had nothing to do with. I was 14 years old. I'm an innocent man, Your Honor, and I have always been an innocent man, Your Honor. One morning I was having breakfast and we had got a bang on our door and it was a gang of police. They rushed into my home and they started saying I was involved in a fight and a robbery and they wanted to take me down to the police station for questioning. August 13th, 1991. Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Two off-duty correction officers were ambushed. Police say the two gunmen forced the officers from their car, shot them, and then stole the car. They took me down to 77 Precinct. The interrogation was actually led by a rogue detective by the name of Louis Garcella, and he was threatening me, telling me that I was never coming home if I wouldn't tell him what he wanted to know. He put me in a lineup with grown men. It made me sit down. And hold a number up and a couple minutes later he came back and told me it was my lucky day that I got picked. I woke up the next day thinking it was a dream. That it was like I was going to be home, that it wasn't real. This is where they say that the officer, the correction officer, was shot and killed. The case was worked by the now disgraced NYPD detective, Louis Scarcella. This happened like four in the morning. I was in my house sleeping at the time when this happened. The only time I got a chance to speak was before sentencing and I spoke to the victim's family and I explained that it's a tragedy if somebody loses their life or get hurt, but I wasn't the one that committed the crime. They wound up sentencing me to 20 years of life. I was a kid, I was a baby. When they sent me to prison, that was like one of the most scariest feelings I ever experienced. And I still, I didn't know how to read. I wanted to communicate with my mother and I just wanted to tell her how I felt. And that motivated me. I started with like dictionaries and children books by the time I was 17, they was also sending me to state prison. So I got my GED and I graduated to state prison. We have some more boxes. New boxes came today. Books. We got a whole bunch of books. John Bunn is like a nephew to me. When he came out of prison, he wanted to start a book drive. So what I did was offer my home to him. Nice. Reading changed my life. Reading changed my mentality as a person. I wrote my mother one day and I said, they can lock my body, but they can't trap my mind. I've been in there where I felt trapped without a voice for so long, but the power of reading could take my imagination and take me to anywhere in this universe. 
and I don't feel like I'm trapped anymore. In order for me to push forward, I dedicated myself to a literacy program, which I started it's called A Voice for Unheard. Psychology, physical therapy. Just look at the type of books that we got. John started a library on Rikers Island in the prison, and he gave over 20,000 books. Good morning, class. <laughs> How y'all doing? I really want to travel all over the country and speak to the kids and tell them my story so they can learn from me if they can in any kind of way possible. And that's like my way of giving back. Can anybody tell me what peer pressure is? What's peer pressure? I consider myself a warrior. I don't consider myself weak. I feel like I can adjust to almost any circumstances after I done been through what I've been through and I could survive it. Let's get a group hug, y'all. One group hug. When I go in them classrooms and I'm with them babies right now, I'm a symbol of leadership to them. There's no greater feeling than me feeling like I'm existing for a purpose, and this is what gives my life purpose right now. Through my adversity and through my misery, I think like God has presented me with a blessing. So through my nightmare, I usually say I found my dream. Bun, uh, the arrest. Bun's ordeal began on August 14th of 1991 when he was sitting in the kitchen of his mother's apartment in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. It was 90 degrees in the shade and the AC was broken. Outside, he could hear hip-hop music playing from passing cars and the thwack of basketballs on the pavement as kids made their way to the courts. Bun's, Bun's mother, Maureen, was making pancakes and his two-year-old sister, India, was cooing in her high chair. Bun, 14 years old, and out of school for the summer, was ready for a typical day of playing ball and demonstrating his famous backflips in and around the four-block radius between the apartment on Ralph Street, his mother's apartment, and the house on St. Mark's, which is his grandma's. Those four blocks, snug between the love of the two women who raised him, were his world. And that's a picture of him, 14 years old. But then a bang on the door. It was the police. They wanted to take me down to the police station for questioning, Bun recalls now, sitting in the same small apartment festooned with family photos nearly three decades later. He was taken to Brooklyn's 77th Precinct, put in a room and handcuffed to a pole. Keep in mind, folks, he is 14 years old. 14 years old. Okay. The interrogation was led by a detective by the name of Louis Garcella. And he was threatening me, telling me that I was never coming home if I wouldn't tell him what he wanted to know. He also told me they already had beat up my co-defendant, that they had slammed his head into a wall, and they already had him, he recalls. The co-defendant, a 17-year-old Brooklyn boy named Rosine Hargrave, Bun knew Hargrave from the block, although he and the older boy were never more than acquaintances. But as soon as he found out that they were both suspected of the same crime, the killing of an off-duty Rikers Island cor correction officer named Rolando Nisher. I kept telling them, no, I don't have any knowledge of it, Bun recalls. But they basically ignored him. It's, you know, mainly this Louis Scarcella. He, a lot of it, uh, he did, he cl clearly did some things because a lot of convictions were overturned because of his detective practices and um, just... He was just doing a lot of things he shouldn't have been doing. A lot of the convictions got overturned because of him. And, you know, and in this case, obviously, an innocent person went to prison. And, uh, you know, so that's the story of the arrest. And then they, they took him down to the police station and, and put him on a, in a lineup with a bunch of grown men. You know, a 14-year-old kid. Put I mean, think about that. How much is a 14-year-old kid going to stand out against four adult men? If you thought a 14-year-old kid committed this crime, why the f, f are you not having other 14-year-old kids in there with him? Why on earth if you think it's a, a four, uh, if you think that a 14-year-old did this, are you putting grown men in the lineup with him? That doesn't make any sense. So that's the story of the arrest, uh, and we'll move on to the next bit of the story now. The night of the killing. 
The day before Bunn was arrested, two off-duty Rikers Island correction officers and old friends, Rolando Nisher and Robert Croson, were sitting in a car, chatting outside of the Kingsboro Projects, a housing project in Crown Heights. It was about 4 a.m. Suddenly, two men on bicycles approached the car, pointed guns, and ordered the pair out of their vehicle. Croson later described at trial how a gun then went off, the bullet ripping through his hand. He managed to get out of the car and sprinted away, losing track of his friend. At some point, Nisher had grabbed his own firearm and fought back. In the ensuing gunfight, before the attackers jumped into the car and drove away, Nisher was shot five times. He was found slumped against a fence, bleeding, but still alive, 192 feet from where the car had been parked. The next day, they came for John Bunn, with Crossun identifying both him and Hargrave in police lineups. Three days after that, Nisher died from his wounds. On the night Nisher and Crossan were carjacked, Bunn had no inkling of what was to come, but his mother had heard a portent. At about 4.30 a.m., Maureen Bunn awoke from a deep sleep to the sound of gunshots. They sounded like they were coming from the backyard in her housing complex near Kingsboro. Uh, I thought, oh my God, I hope everybody's okay, she says, recalling the incident 27 years later. Instinctively, she padded to her children's room, peering into the dark to check on them. Minutes after the bullets had, had killed Nisher, tracked their fatal course through the soupy August air that night, Marie noted with relief that her kids were safe. John lay sound asleep in his bunk. The Trial On August 17th, Bunn was formally charged with robbery and murder. He was sent to the notorious Spoford Juvenile Detention Center in the Bronx, a vermin-infested concrete building, building that was shut down in 2011 after allegations of violence and abuse. There he waited for 16 months. Spoford was one of the most violent places I ever experienced, Bunn says. The staff members were very abusive. It was, it was like gladiator school. You had to fight maybe three or four times a day. What's more, there was a target on his back because he had been charged with killing a corrections officer. The months rolled by as he waited for trial. His 15th, birth 15th birthday came and went, and increasingly depressed and scared, Bun didn't tell anyone about it. Now just think about that for a second. This 14-year-old kid is completely innocent. Okay? And he's and he's being he's been charged with murdering a corrections officer and and I mean that's what that's alluding to right there it's saying that um you know that the that the staff members were very abusive you know and it was like gladiator school I mean that's to me that's him saying you know him being charged with murdering a corrections officer that that just made everything even harder you know he had a target on his back you know what I mean it's just like oh lord you know this is why dirty investigators or or just shady investigations and 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 prosecutor misconduct this is why they matter because crap like this happens uh yeah you can't be we can't be just in this country anymore just chasing convictions because somebody wants to get reelected that's got to end that's got to stop but you know so here's a picture of the entrance to the place where he waited for his trial things like birthdays stopped existing to me he says time stopped in there still bun and his mother believed the trial would show he was not nisha's killer among other factors croissant the sole witness in the crime had described the carjackers as being light-skinned men in their 20s john was darker skinned and a short slight framed teenager very slight framed actually remember the picture that we saw above you know, or in, you know, a couple, couple clips ago, remember the picture of him with his bike? I mean, he was a, a very thin 14 year old kid. How, how he could be mistaken for a, 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 a light skinned kid in his twenties. I have no clue. And, and, and these are the hallmarks of wrongful convictions. The, you, you always have something like this where the, the, the victim's description doesn't match the, the defendant. And, and things like that. I mean, it's just, it's something I've noticed going through wrongful convictions as I have been for the last couple of years now, uh, focusing on this particular topic. It just, I see common themes that run through these wrongful convictions. And that's an example of one right there. 
there's the detective Scarcella. That's the guy. Uh, you know, the dirty dealer. So, the truth didn't prevail. It didn't come out. My side of the story never came out either. I never got a chance to have a voice. I never got a chance to say anything, Bun says. Bun was sentenced to 20 years to life, though it was later reduced to 9 years to life after lawyers successfully argued that he had been illegally charged as an adult. Hargrave received a sentence of 30 years to life. He, what the... What? He... How, he'd been illegal, illegally charged. You charged a 14-year-old kid as an adult? Originally? I mean, holy crap. <laughs> what What is going on over here in Brooklyn with these cops? And what's going on here? I mean, this is ridiculous. It's a 14-year-old kid. How did he get tried as an adult? Especially on such weak evidence. Especially when he doesn't match the description given by the eyewitness. It's just bizarre and and shameful really imprisonment after being found guilty bun was immediately taken to a youth facility upstate marine visited as much as she could spending all her money on long bus rides upstate as the household bills and eviction notices stacked up but john was isolated physically and mentally for a long time he had hidden a secret he had never learned to read or write I was further away from my family. I wanted to communicate with my mother because I felt if I felt like me and her didn't have the best relationship. And I was out there and I just wanted to tell her how I felt and that motivated me, he says. Determined to be able to write letters to his mom, Bun started with dictionaries and children's books, working with teachers on how to sound words out uh, letter by letter. It was humbling at first, but he learned fast, and as he got the hang of it, he says, it did something for my self-esteem and my imagination. By the time he was 17, Bun had his GED and was reading anything he could get his hands on from the prison library. But turning 17 also marked a more sobering milestone. He would soon be eligible to be transferred to an adult facility. These are some uh, pictures that he kept on his in his cell um, when he was, you know, in jail. <clears throat> I got my GED and I graduated to state prison, says Bun, adding that he remembers the bus journey to the facility as one of the scariest feelings I ever experienced. You hear all the stories about how people get raped and there's knives and there's razors, but all along that bus ride, I went from being fearful and intimidated to suddenly becoming aggressive because I felt like I had to be aggressive in order for them not to take advantage of me, he says. Bun noticed that increasingly he was finding his anger hard to control. I became institutionalized to the point where I, st I start letting the experience make me angry. I started being bitter in there and started getting into violent situations. This is, uh, you know, the what the facility, the adult facility he was transferred to looks like. Old Victorian building. Through it all, uh, one thing kept him level-headed. Uh, to those in prison, he may have been John Bunn, inmate number 712-9748-Q. Brooklyn boy, corrections officer killer. But, with a book in his hand, lying in his bunk on G Block at Elmira Correctional Facility, an imposing Victorian building that sits high on a hill in upstate New York, Bun felt free. In the daytime, he began taking anger management classes, passing them with such flying colors that he became a qualified anger management counselor himself, running his own program for inmates. At night, he would return to his cell where he would read slowly so he had something to look forward to, savoring each word amidst the familiar soundtrack of the prison at night. The hum of 50 radios all softly playing different stations. The monologues of top dog inmates holding court for 10 minutes at a time as, they, as others kept a respectful silence. And the ever-present clang of the gates that slammed and opened, slammed and opened, signaling the night and heralding the morning. It's a picture of him with his mom and his sister. Uh, it's actually in, in this is actually a prison. A pic picture was taken in prison, um, but uh, it's an interesting uh, inmate shirt. But anyway, uh, I wrote my mother one day and I said, they can lock my body, but they can't trap my mind, Bun says. The power of reading made me feel that way. I felt trapped without a voice for so long, but the power of reading could take my imagination and take me anywhere in the universe, in this universe. In 2006, Bun saved a prison counselor from being violently assaulted and raped by another inmate. 
His heroic actions were a factor in the parole board's decision to release him that year. Bunn walked out of Elmira wearing a shirt, shorts, and a pair of Timberland boots bought for him by his family, and with his forty dollars of gate money, earned his seven dollar, earned from his seven dollar fifty cent a week prison salary in his pocket. When I got to the lobby, my brother and cousin were there. Once I got to them, I felt safe, he says. It was the first time I felt like I was safe again in 17 years. Exoneration. But out on parole, Bunn struggled. With his criminal record as a convicted murderer, he couldn't get a job. He was diagnosed with PTSD and was granted Social Security and disability. Then in 2008, after struggling with depression, he failed to report to a, for a parole meeting and was sent back to jail. He returned to prison for another year and was released in 2009. I wasn't able to adjust after being alone and gone for so long, he says. This is his uh, prison ID there. But Bunn was about to get some long-awaited good news. In 2010, the Exoneration Initiative, a nonprofit organization that provides legal assistance to the wrongfully convicted in New York, began looking into Bunn's and Hargrave's convictions. Hargrave had not been granted parole and remained behind bars. And, on top of that, many of Detective Sarcella's convictions from the 80s and 90s were beginning to crumble one by one. In April 2014 came a breakthrough. A new motion was filed by Rojan Hargrave's legal team to vacate the charges. The pattern and practice of Sarcella's conduct, which manifests a disregard for rules, law, and the truth, undermines our judicial system and gives cause for a new review of the evidence, declared the judge in the case, Justice Shand Sh Shandia Simpson. Judge Simpson overturned Rojan Hargrave's convictions and ordered a new trial. After 24 years in prison, Hargrave was released on bond pending trial. A year later, after a similar motion was filed on John Bunn's behalf by the Exoneration Initiative, his own day in court came. In her ruling, Judge Simpson called the evidence used against Bunn paltry and slammed what she called Scarcella's uh, disregard for rules, law, and truth. In May of 2018, after 27 years of wrongful conviction, the district attorney's office announced that they would not retry Rajan Hargrave or John Bunn. They became the 12th and 13th men to be exonerated of convictions related to investigations by Detective Louis Scarcella. After Judge Simpson announced he was a free man, Bunn addressed the courtroom. I am an innocent man, Your Honor, and I have always been an innocent man, he said, both tears streaming down his face as his mother Maureen audibly gulped back sobs. That's him with the judge there. She clearly <laughs> saw that he had been, he'd received some, uh, yeah, bad justice, I guess. So I really, uh, that's, that's all. That's really great. I like judges that can, that can look at, look at the situation and go, okay, wait, this isn't right. This actually undermines what the justice system is all about. Um, yeah, that's we we can't just like Zellner was said in her recent award ceremony. She's like, you, you know, we cannot just allow these prosecutors and these and these law enforcement, um, you know, officers to just have complete immunity to where they can even kill somebody when they're off duty and they have like complete immunity. It's ridiculous. And what this guy was doing for there to already be, uh, for for them to be, for uh, sorry, for Hargrave and Bun to be exonerations twelve and thirteen, you know, I mean, he dude was clearly, I mean, for that many exonerations to be coming from from just because of him and and the way he conducted himself on the cases, I mean, where there's smoke, there's fire. There's probably so many other cases. And, and and as you're going to see the the district attorney's office in in uh, Staten Island or in um, in in um, Brooklyn or whatever uh, they are going to they are going to be flagging a bunch more of his cases so it's interesting to date 70 of detective Scarcella's cases from the 80s and 90s have been flagged for review and at least 14 of Scarcella's homicide convictions have been overturned because of the tainted evidence, mis misleading testimony, or forced confessions, according to the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. But it's unlikely that Scarcella will face any consequences. He has never been charged with a crime, according to the DA. Prosecutors have, found, have not found any laws that can be prosecuted today. The statute of limitations has expired for any potential criminal offenses. 
CNN's attempts to reach Detective Scarcillo were not successful, but he told the Daily News in 2018 that he had done absolutely nothing wrong. Yet 13, 14 men have been released from prison, and he did nothing wrong. Yeah. Sounds like he learned from the same school and from uh, with, that, they, that they teach the Manitowoc law enforcement officers. Um, anyway, so, yeah, that's that's what he had to go through. That's That's what John Bunn had to go through. I mean... It's it's pretty wild, but I'll tell you what I like the way that he has he has taken this negative in his life and he's really turning it into a positive, positive. Um, and you know his he's trying to he's really he really wants to pass on his love for reading. He um, he he's trying to he's trying to create the situation where other inmates might be able to do for themselves what he did um, and educate themselves and and that sort of thing. I just like what this guy's doing. I mean, he could have just been bitter and angry and, and you know, and just mad at the world. But he, he, he didn't he didn't go that way. He still has love. Uh, and he and he still, you know, he, he still sees he still sees things somewhat optimistically, even after everything that happened to him. And he wants to help. And I, I just got to say hands on, ha, you know you know hats off hats off to, to John Bunn I think it's truly amazing what he's endured and and the way that he has chosen to handle it and conduct himself I just I am extremely impressed extremely impressed with Mr. Bunn I, I, I hope he's a shining example for more people particularly wrongfully convicted but hey I'll settle for I'll settle for, you know, the criminals in, in, in jail and stuff, looking at him in, as an example and educating themselves so that they can hopefully break out of the cycles that they're in. Not saying it's going to happen for everybody, but giving yourself the tools gives you a chance. And, you know, I know a lot of criminals are just going to repeat and go back, but if we're given, if we give, if they have the tools, you know, for you know which is what guys like John Bunn are trying to give them and they have the tools and they learn there's they have a better chance of not repeating and coming back it's you know and I'm not saying we need to we I'm not saying we need to move heaven and earth for them all 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 that John Bunn is doing is very humble he's providing books so that that prisoners can educate themselves the way he did I just think it's amazing. I think it's great. Hats off to Mr. Bun. A new chapter. There's a palpable sense of excitement in a classroom at Ember Charter School in Brooklyn, where 25 third graders await that morning's class speaker. When John Bun walks into the room after a rousing chorus of good morning, John Bun, the class tumbles around him, lining up for hugs and high fives. It's his second visit. He says the kids were so great the first time and had such smart questions that he had promised them that he would come back. This time he's bearing presents, tiny t-shirts in an array of clothes, each with a logo that spells out the name of his new nonprofit organization, A Voice for the Unheard. Bunn's project began as a book drive aimed at refurbishing the libraries at Rikers Island and providing under-resourced communities with educational literature. So far, he's donated over 20,000 books to help others affected by illiteracy and incarceration. So that's him with the kids in the class there. Reading changed my life, Bunn says. I want to share that experience with other people. Along with starting a library on Rikers, he also works at the prison twice a week, running group sessions with 16 and 17 year olds. He's also starting a book club for the teens and leading group discussions. More than anything, Bunn doesn't want the young boys he mentors to give up and become institutionalized. I really like this guy. I really like this guy. I explain to them, anything is possible. Feel like you're too good to be in there, he says. Good advice. Back to Ember Charter School, Bunn is leading a classroom discussion. Who here can tell me what peer pressure is, Bunn asked the class, as a staccato wave of small hands shoots into the air. He guides the children through a question and answer session, 
then doles out a bunch of t-shirts in pink, yellow, and black. The kids war- swarm bun when the session is over. Let's get a group hug, y'all, he says as the kids clamor, clamor on chairs to get closer to him. Bun's eyes fill with tears. There's no greater feeling than me feeling like I'm existing for a purpose, and this is what gives my life purpose now, he says. Through my nightmare, I found my dream. And bravo, Mr. Bun. Bravo. So, that's the story of John Bunn, and like I said, man, I, I just think the world of him, he's, to be such a trooper, I mean, yeah, it sucks to be wrongfully, absolutely does, I, I mean, and yet he has not let that stop him, he has not let that take his joy, he, it's just, I just think the world of him, I think after what he's been through, and he is now focusing his life to help other youngsters who were in his, like that are in the position that he was in. I just think that's great. It's really great. I just think I just can't say it enough that I just think very very highly of this guy. I just love the way that he chose to take lemons and make lemonade. Um, just awesome. I can't. It's just enough. It's just so great. It's such an uplifting story. It's so... It, it it renews my faith in humanity. It really does. It truly does. The things that the human spirit can do, the perseverance that it's capable of, it's, it's an amazing thing. And here we have a perfect example. You know, so... Let us not forget, the reason why I'm making these videos here about wrongful convictions of youth is, of course, because of Brendan Dassey. That was a little piece of artwork that we had made up, you know, to kind of represent the issues, I think, when it comes to Brendan Dassey's case. But anyway, brilliant piece of artwork made by my uh, good friend, Susan S. And uh, just, you know... Uh, just that's why we're here. I mean, that's why I'm continuing to cover how the justice system is treating juveniles and particularly the mentally limited ones. Um, it, it, I intend to put a white hot spotlight if I can. That's my goal. So that's about it for today, folks. If you haven't already, please hit subscribe and we'll see you.